Hello, and welcome back to Bite-Sized Neo4j for Data Scientists. We're already at part 10 of our series. Today, we're going to talk about this idea of an in-memory graph, which is kind of the backbone of the graph data science library. There are two ways to create in-memory graphs. We're going to talk about one of them today, which is through cipher projections. My name is Claire Sullivan. I'm a data science advocate at Neo4j, and here's how to find me on the internet. OK. I always start with a list of links. The top link is how to create a free sandbox instance on Neo4j. The second one is the playlist of all the videos in this series. And the third one is the repository for all the code. OK, let's get started on why would we want to create an in-memory graph. Well, there's a few reasons for this. First off, we, it's a bad idea to run algorithms on the full graph. And there's a few reasons for that. First off, um, a lot of times these algorithms, they really only make sense to run them on a monopartite graph, such as, which, which means graphs of the same node type. Also, a lot of them require that they run on undirected graphs. So by creating an in-memory graph, you're selecting only the data that you want to use for your calculations. Secondly, if you're running these algorithms on the entire graph, depending on the size of your graph, it can be really slow. So, Another thing to keep in mind is that when you create this subset of your data, it's stored in memory, which means we can run many calculations against it. So that's kind of cool. All right, so I've created a sandbox instance here of our, um, it's the Graph Data Science Sandbox Instance, which comes preloaded with the Game of Thrones graph. And I can just look at that really quick. We're just going to look at all of the nodes in this graph, get a visualization, and see if it makes sense. So I can see here that, yeah, I've got a graph. It looks like the Game of Thrones graph, and that's all well and good. OK, now let's actually create an in-memory graph. So we, like I said, are going to be using Cypher to create those. There's another way to create them that I'll talk about in a future video called Native Projections. So what's happened here? I've created this graph. And the graph is of name people. So I start by giving a graph name. And then I have a node query. And what the node query is doing is it's saying, I want all of my person nodes. And I'm mapping them to some ID space. Um, those IDs, they don't have a lot of physical meaning. So we're not going to worry too much about what they look like. Um, but th that's how GDS functions. So then I have this bottom string here, which is a relationship query. And what my relationship query is doing here is I'm saying, I want this relationship. So this is every person interacting in any way with any other person. I'm going to return the IDs of those um, for each of those people. And I'm going to call it source and target. Now, it's very important that you maintain this convention of using ID, source, and target. OK, GDS ex um, expects that when you create these graphs. All right, so that's how we have created a graph. We now have an in-memory graph of people. There are 2166 nodes and 8,170 relationships. So we can use that in-memory graph by name uh, to run our GDS algorithms against. We're not going to do GDS algorithms today beyond creating a graph, but just give you an idea of where you start. OK, let's create a more sophisticated one now. It turns out that our GDS graph is weighted. OK, so the strength of interactions, the strength of relationships between two nodes is included in this graph. So I'm going to create a second graph here that I'm going to call people-weighted. And again, I have that same node query. Um, but now my relationship query is a little different. In this case, I'm going to specify all of my interacts relationships between two people. Um, and I return my source and my target. But I'm also returning the weight of the interaction. So I can run that. Um, but how do I know that it actually did the right thing? Well, I have another function that we can use for that. We're going to stream back our relationship properties. Every time you see the word stream within GDS, it means put it out to the screen. Don't write it to like the nodes or anything like that. So I'm going to stream back from this graph here um, my weights. And um, I, I bring out of that, that streaming thing my source node ID, my target node ID, and my property value. Now, I said before that everything gets stored in this identification uh, node like um, integer here. This, this GDS util as node gives us back what those IDs are, it converts it back into things that make sense, such that I see that Eddard Stark and Robert Baratheon have the highest weight of interaction. We can make our, our, 
um, in memory graphs pretty sophisticated. For instance, I can create a multigraph here, which all this is doing, it's the same idea. Um, I, I have though different node types. I'm saying that I'm looking at nodes that are either people or kings, and I have different relationship types here. I'm saying it interacts with in season one or pipe interacts in season five. Okay, and so I can run that, um, and that creates me a different graph. So, um, I just want to point out that we can also get the list of our in-memory graphs, which ones are still available to us, by calling GDS graph list, and that gives us all of the graph names that we have here. At the very end, it's a good idea to clean up because you're using some memory this way, so I'd call GDS graph drop on my graph name. All right, that's how you create a graph in Cypher. So I just want to say thank you. Please reach out if you have ideas for future videos that you'd like to see, and have a great day.